Welcome and thank you all for joining us today for our online session in response to the COVID-19 crisis. My name is Raya Mana and I am a member of the IAVE team. We hope you're safe and healthy during these concerning times and always. As the coronavirus pandemic continues affecting our world, IAVE is committed to help volunteers and volunteer organizations deal with the challenges it presents. We have prepared a series of webinars and resources to help you best respond to this crisis. To learn more about these resources, visit us at iave.org slash COVID-19. Our organization strives to build an inclusive network open to individuals and organizations of all capacities and resources. Please visit us at iave.org slash join dash now to learn more and follow us on social media. We're only a robust organization if we can have you as a member. The worldwide pandemic has changed many facets of life. Volunteer programs are no exception. While corporate employees have been volunteering in many forms for years, hands-on, skills-based, pro bono, cross-border, all but virtual volunteering has pretty much come to a standstill. However, some companies have pivoted to create new and innovative ways to tap employees' enthusiasm for volunteering and to meet grow a growing list of community needs. Today, we'll learn how Canadian firm Telos is making creative adjustments to their employee volunteer programs. A couple of important announcements as we start. This webinar is being recorded and will be available in our COVID-19 response website. For questions, please type them in the question box and our moderator will convey them to our presenter. Let me start by introducing our moderator for today's session, Lori Foster. Lori is the director of the corporate strategy for IAVE. In this capacity, she facilitates networks of leaders from major global companies, including the Global Corporate Volunteer Council and the Research Working Group on Disaster-Related Corporate Volunteering. She holds a master's in public administrations from the Harvard Kennedy School and a bachelor's in diplomacy and world affairs from Occidental College. Thank you, Lori, for leading today's sessions and welcome everyone. Thank you, Raida. Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to be your host for today's session. Many companies have amazing employee volunteer programs, but mo like most every other activity in our world today, they had to adapt to the new realities created by the pandemic. Obviously, they had to adapt because in almost every country, employees were required to stay at home. And in most cases, many of us are still there. At the same time, the needs of individuals and communities have become different and more urgent. At IAVE, we have been able to witness the adaptations and in innovations of many companies. As Raida said, we have a community of global companies in our Global Corporate Volunteer Council, 45 major global companies with many of the world's best employee volunteer programs. They share their programs, ideas, and challenges for now in monthly virtual meetings. IAVE is also in the process of conducting a significant piece of new research on the future of global corporate volunteering. So we have learned of additional stories of companies pivoting to develop new volunteer programs to meet the new realities. So what we have found is that companies have been responding to the COVID-19 in four significant ways. First of all, through philanthropy. Companies have been contributing, for example, to the COVID-19 Solidary Response Fund, or WHO, the World Health Organization. They've also contributed in a number of other ways to support communities who need relief in this time of emergency. Many companies we've seen also have employee matching grant programs, and under normal times, they'll match one-to-one, -one, but we've seen many of them responding with a two-to-one match, and sometimes with uh, maximums up to $10,000 per employee. Secondly, companies have been responding with their products and services. 
So companies with hotels have been providing rooms for medical workers. Logistics and transport firms have been ferrying medical supplies. And some are repurposing their factories to make a different and much needed product. Ventilators, masks. There's a French company that is, instead of making perfume and cognac, producing hand sanitizer. I tried to get some of that, but have not been successful yet. Employee assistance funds are the third way that companies have been helping in this COVID response. They are providing extra, extra funds for companies, for employees who are struggling in this time. And fourth, employee volunteering. We've seen a number of really interesting in-person and virtual uh, employee volunteer programs that have been adjusted to meet the demands of the COVID-19. Our guest speaker today, Allison Ferry, will describe the way her company, TELUS, has adapted their volunteer program to the new realities. There will be time after Allison's presentation to ask questions and also to share how your company has adapted the program. So be thinking of that when we get to that portion of the program. I had the good fortune last year to facilitate a session at IAVE's Asia Pacific Volunteer Conference in Bangkok, where I met Phoebe Carrera of TELUS International. And after learning of their employee volunteer program, I was eager to invite them to share with you today. So I'm pleased to now introduce you to Allison Ferry. Allison is the Senior Project Manager for Corporate Citizenship and Communications. And in that role, she leads TELUS's employee and retiree engagement programs, Team TELUS Cares. Allison has over 10 years of CSR experience and she is a graduate of um, the master's program in business administration from Simon Fraser University. And she has an undergraduate degree from the University of British Columbia. She also, has also served on the board of the Ottawa School of Art. So I'm pleased to turn this over to Allison to share with us uh, about TELUS's program. Allison, welcome. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you. All right, let me get my screen ready here for you guys. Perfect. Is it working for, can everyone see my screen? Perfect. 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 Wonderful. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much, Laurie. And uh, as you guys have mentioned, 2020 has been an extraordinary year for all of us. This pandemic has changed our entire world, not only in our personal lives, but also in the way we do business. For us at TELUS, we were suddenly faced with incredible challenges to every aspect of our business. We had to innovate and adapt quickly to protect our customers, our team, and our communities who needed support more than ever. So how do we serve communities amid social distancing rules? How do we give care to those who cannot interact with us anymore? I'm Alison Ferry, and I'm here to talk to you about how we evolved our giving programs to support Canadians during this public health crisis. For 10 years, I've led TELUS's employee and retiree CSR program, which we call Team TELUS Cares. At TELUS, we are committed to doing good in our communities, and we've been doing it for more than 20 years. It's built right into our DNA, and it's the single most mentioned reason for why people join our company. Every year, we bring together more than 40,000 volunteers across nine countries during TELUS Days of Giving, which is our global signature volunteer movement. And this year marks our 15 years of TELUS Days of Giving. Now, before I go any further, I know we have many of you on the call from attending from all over the world. So I first wanted to quickly share a little bit about TELUS and who we are and what we do. TELUS is based out of Canada and we serve over 15 million customers nationally. We specialize in mobile, landline, TV, internet, and home security services. We provide access to digital healthcare as the largest health IT organization in Canada. We offer innovative business, promote, business process solutions to some of the world's most established brands and through our TELUS international offices in over 20 countries. And we are committed to ensuring that we are taking care of our communities where we live, work, and serve. And one way we do this is through our signature global volunteer movement, TELUS Days of Giving, which brings, as I mentioned, together more than 40,000 volunteers around the globe to give back over 1 million volunteer hours. 
So typically, TELUS Days of Giving, or we call it T-Dog here at TELUS, takes place during May and June. And this is our kickoff for our year-round giving, which inspires our TELUS family to give back. It's a time that brings everyone together. Typically in the past, our, our activities would range from 10 to 600 plus volunteers. And activities would include gardening or doing room makeovers at local charitable organizations, refurbishing computers to donate to schools, building schools, which we did in Guatemala, hosting fundraisers, serving meals to the hungry, packing over 13,000 backpacks filled with school supplies. This was a time for the TELUS family to get together and collectively give back. These were great team building activities and networking opportunities to meet other team members within the organization. It was also a chance to learn about new charities and make bonds with them. We would typically have over 2,000 volunteer activities available. And this year is our 15th year of TELUS Days of Giving, and it was not what we were expecting at all. So when the pandemic first hit, and when everyone went into you know, lockdown, stay home orders were put in place, we were initially thinking we would have to cancel TELUS Days of Giving. However, immediately, within a day, everyone started reaching out to us asking, how can we help? What can we do? And we quickly realized we couldn't cancel TELUS Days of Giving, and more than ever, we needed our giving platform. So we pivoted and uh, canceled all of our in-person activities and looked to see where we could adapt safe and virtual acts of giving. Our single first most concern was keeping our team members and our community safe. We decided to open up our TELUS Days of Giving program to be year-round versus our two-month campaign. And we provided three ways for everyone to participate. They could volunteer by joining a TELUS Days of Giving activity or creating their own. They could donate. By, to the charity of their toy, choice, or joining Donate the Change, which I will explain to you in the next slide, or they could share their acts of giving on social media. And I'm going to go further into these next three sections in my next slides. So, but, whoops, volunteering. As I mentioned, they could either create their own activity or sign up for an activity that we had posted. And here's a spotlight on my slides of just over some of the over 150 activities we now have up on our site. And we're constantly adding new volunteer activities every week. So team members can help sew face masks, gowns, and other personal protection items. We have a volunteer group at TELUS called the TELUS Community Ambassadors. And they're made up of our TELUS team members and retirees. And they stepped up and they made hundreds of masks. It was absolutely incredible what they were able to do. We even had some of our retirees teaching their grandchildren how to sew uh, as they were all at home as well. We also set up an uh, activity called Creating Cards for Seniors, which was a really great family activity for everyone to do. They, what they would do is make homemade cards. They would in include drawings, puzzles, Sudoku um, crossword puzzles in it, and then they would find a senior's home and send it off to them. And it was a great way to teach uh, the younger children uh, at home and to have a family activity showing how easy it is to give back. And it was fantastic for the seniors to let them know that people were thinking of them during this crisis. We also had um, a lot of online learning courses that they could do. So they could learn to do a naloxone administration course. They could also um, adapt uh, sorry, download an, an app called Be My Eyes. And this one was really cool. So what it is, is you download your app. And so a visually impaired person who might be out and can't see something, uh, they would go onto their app and put a ping out requesting for someone to see what they're doing. And you, what you do is you can either accept it or deny it. And you have to be quick because there's so many people on there who are right there ready to help. And you see their eyes for them. And it's really cool because it only can take about two minutes. And it's just whenever you have a few moments, you've got this opportunity to help someone else out. We have um, Grow a Bro, which is uh, one of our team's favorites. And this one's where you literally grow um, in your backyard. Or for those who are in apartments, we um, you know, suggested to them to have egg cartons and plant seeds. And they could grow. Uh, fresh produce that they would then donate to their local food bank. iNatural Observer this is another simple one where you download the app and you share wildlife sightings in your local communities with scientists and it helps them put together data that they wouldn't necessarily be able to go out in person and collect. 
And so this helps them uh, figuring out uh, what's going on within the planet. We also have uh, Lending an Ear, which was uh, you could become a crisis responder for the kids' help phone. As we knew, um, I found out there was a big strain ha happening uh, during the, the kind of the beginning weeks of the pandemic. We also had our All Connected for Good care calls. And this was first started with our TELUS community ambassadors, as I mentioned. Our retirees started calling our other retirees, and it kind of became this phone tree to connect with others and find out how everyone was doing, making sure they were um, being heard, seen, and you know, finding out if they needed help with anything. The Good Neighbor Project is another really cool one we had. And so this one is literally, as it sounds, being a good neighbor. So dropping off groceries uh, to elderly neighbors who may not be able to go out, uh, picking up medication, dropping off care kits, checking in on your neighbors. Um, we had a lot of people sign up for this one as well. And then uh, donating blood. We, there was a uh, Canadian call to action for need for blood donors. And so we wanted to ensure we had this on our site to bring awareness. And then donate, as I was mentioning. Um, so at TELUS, we have um, the TELUS Future Friendly Foundation, which uh, TELUS was one of the uh, founding donors for. And the foundation helps give vulnerable kids a brighter future through education and technology. And so we have a program called Donate the Change. And what this is, is a really awesome thing. So anybody who's a TELUS customer, you can, uh, on your bill, you just click that you want to participate and it rounds up your bill to the nearest dollar. So for less than a dollar a month, less than $12 a year, your do um, money will go to the Future Friendly Foundation. And everything that was being done through the foundation, um, through Donate the Change, was going directly to support COVID-19. So it was a really fun, easy way to participate without having to do, to do too much um, and feel like you're giving back. They could also host a fundraiser um, or donate to the Friendly Found Future Foundation or, of course, to any charity of their choice that they selected. So uh, another thing, as I mentioned, was sharing. So throughout the month of May, we had our Stay Giving campaign and where we invited our entire TELUS family and all Canadians to take action and join the TELUS Day Giving Challenge. So what we asked them to do was really simply take a photo or video of them giving back. It could be absolutely anything they're doing. So whether it was you know, picking up groceries for their neighbor, uh, being on Be My Eyes app, take a picture of it, upload it to social media, use the hashtag Stay Giving, and then tag three people to join them in giving back and help inspire others to continue giving throughout. And so even before we had this campaign, we were collecting all of our team members' stories and we were posting them on social media. And our CEO, Darren Entweisel, ha ha posted them on his personal Instagram account, recognizing our team members and retirees and sharing their stories. So in the first two pictures, you can see we've got our team members participating in the Good Neighbor Project, dropping off groceries, in the third picture, we have um, one of our team members who's using 3D printers to create personal protection um, equipment, the masks there. And then on the end is our TELUS retiree who is sewing. And what we really wanted to do here was shine a spotlight on the human aspect of giving and really inspire others to give back and show how simple and active giving can be. So, you know, it's health days of giving is now year round. We don't have any of our final results, but I did want to share with you some of the early results that we've been able to capture. So far, we have tracked an incredible, I, I still can't believe this, 450,000 volunteer hours and 150 acts of giving, which is just incredible. And throughout COVID-19, our TELUS family has given $150 million in support of immediate relief efforts. We've donated 11, over 11,000 devices through our Mobility for Good program, which is where we help Canadian youth emerging from foster care uh, gain independence, providing them a free phone and a $0 plan for two years. We've also hand-sewn over 100,000 masks, and we're still counting. It's incredible. And I realized I, I didn't explain what an active giving is. So an active giving is um, every unique transaction that is done through our 
uh, giving platform, which reuses Benevity. And so where they sign up for a telestasis of giving activity, they make a donation, they're tracking their hours, they're, they're um, making the hands-on mask, donating a device through the Mobility for Good program. So lessons learned for us, what we've, uh, you know, it, as we're still going through this, we're still learning lessons, um, but um, what we've just really discovered was shining a spotlight on the real human stories is what's been leading us to these incredible results. It's inspiring to see your fellow team members, somebody you know giving back and you want, you see how easy it is and you want to continue doing it. We also realize people want to help in a time of need, but they often don't know what to do. So having, by providing this giving platform for them, this provides them that access to figuring out and giving them those steps. Simple communication with step-by-step -step instructions and specific ways on how to give. People like to rally behind something big. So when we challenged our team to collectively make those face masks, everybody stepped up and many people who had never sewn before were picking it up. It was incredible to see. And doing good and giving back has been really rooted in our culture of TELUS for over 20 years. And so our TELUS team would have expected nothing less from us to you know, have our TELUS days of giving continue. I think if we'd canceled it, we would have really been hearing about it and they needed it for, um, from us. And um, you know, we had to shift to virtual giving. And so we had a commitment to our communities. Uh, we couldn't let them down and they needed us more than ever. And a pandemic wasn't gonna stop us. So it was, we wanted to really continue this giving movement with them. So this is, uh, kind of leads me to the end of my presentation. Um, and I'm sure you have tons of questions. So I will open up to Lori to uh, start asking the questions uh, that you've been asking through the pool. Thank you, Allison. Um, I believe the human connection that has been part of your program really uh, did probably make a big difference in terms of the participation levels, which were mm -hmm. pretty astounding. Um, I do have a question about, uh, before I open it to the others, to your Lending an Ear program, which is, mm -hmm. you said, helping children in crisis. Can you explain a bit more about how that works and, and what sorts of crises were your employees dealing with? Yeah, so um, there was two programs. The was the, the Kids Help Phone and then the L Connected for Good uh, Care Calls. Uh, so the Kids Help Phone is a charitable organization where um, children can call in. And so really what this is, is this was you would sign up and you would um, go through some training to uh, then become a crisis responder for the Kids Help Phone. And that was all done through the Kids Help Phone organization. The All Connected for Good Care Calls, that was organized by our TELUS retirees, and it was more of a grassroots approach where they were start calling other retirees that they knew, uh, and then some of them would say, oh, could you also check on my other uh, TELUS retiree friend and see how they're doing as they don't necessarily have family or friends around. Um, but the kids help phone part was really done through their organization. We were really kind of the, the connector um, in bringing our team members to that organization um, back to where I was saying, you know, people want to help, but often they don't know what to do or where to go. And so this was an, um, an opportunity for them to kind of pr provide some examples of some activities they could sign up for, and then they could choose if they wanted to do that one or not. And did they, did your employees get special training to deal with crisis response? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they, the kids help phone with, so they would sign up for the activity, um, connect with kids help phone, and then the kids help phone would put them through a training uh, program. They wouldn't just go onto the phone right away. Um, it was, a, uh, they, they regulated it and having specific um, training programs for them. Great, great. And we have a question from Andronica Mabuya from Discovery in South Africa. She asked, how did you ensure the safety and wellness of your employees uh, that that would take precedence, especially when going out to volunteering during COVID? I mean, you had a lot of employees out in their communities. Normally we see that companies had a lot of virtual programs, but you had a lot of people out and about. How did you keep them safe? So we um, we actually did cancel all of our in-person activities we because um, that was our first concern as well was the safety. So um, 
where you would see some of them is if they were going out, that was um, just to pick up groceries for themselves. We asked them to wear uh, personal protective equipment, so the face mask, the gloves, ensuring that they were following the social distancing guidelines of, um, I know in each uh, country it's a little bit different. So in Canada, ours is a, a distance of six feet um, that we had to, we wanted to ensure we kept. If there was any activities where we were talking to an organization, they said that they could not maintain the six feet uh, foot social distancing guideline, then we did not post that activity on our site. Um, so no, we, we really wanted to make sure everybody was staying safe. That was one of our biggest things is that it's um, we because we had all of our in-person activities up. So as soon as it happened, we went in and canceled every activity. And then we only started posting them if they were virtual or if we could guarantee that they were safe. So many of the activities where if you do see somebody out, it was them as a single person going out, not as a group activity. Uh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, there's a question about how you track your volunteer hours because you had an amazing amount of hours how, and it's always been a challenge to, <laughs> to get employees to register those hours. How did you do that? Yeah, so um, we have a, um, on our giving platform where they can um, go onto the site and then they track their hours themselves. So we ask them to put in, um, you know, what they've done and then the number of hours that they've, they've done with it and sort of just a quick um, explanation of what it is. Also with our activities, when you sign up for an activity, it sends you a reminder to please track your hours with it. Um, and a lot of them to the activities there's a preset hours in it so you can just click you know track my hours with it okay. and we're we're always constantly um in through all of our communications um we're also we've got a campaign going next week where we're trying um starting in july where we're encouraging our team members to track their those hours so that we are able to uh, properly communicate it um and it, as I kind of mentioned before, it, this has been rooted in our TELUS DNA. So the team knows to go in. Um, for the last three years in a row, we've been able to track over 1 million volunteer hours, which is just incredible to see what that we've been able to do as a, as a team. So they're used to doing it. it. It took a bit of time, you know, to kind of train them to do it. But uh, this is the accumulation of over 20 years of volunteering and giving back. Now, Allison, I know that you manage the Canadian program, and we wanted to focus mm -hmm. this presentation on Canada. But do you know how this compares to uh, TELUS operations in other countries, the volunteering? Yeah, so um, they, we, as, you know, I did mention we've got our TELUS days of giving internationally. And so each country is a little bit different with the pandemic. There has been... Um, uh, or, you know, um, sorry, what I'm trying to say is that they've um, been giving different variations to all the, so we've canceled them all for now, and we're going to relook at them to see if it will be safe at the end of the year, but we most likely will keep them canceled all face-to-face -face for the rest of the year. And they're, they are doing the virtual ones similar to us and fundraising. Great. And we have a question, how do you think giving back has made an impact on your employees? Sorry, can you repeat that? How do you think that giving back uh, through the, the different activities you've set up, what do you think the impact has been on your employees? Oh, I think for them, it's been giving them a sense of hope that they've been able to help out. Um, we've really seen our, you know, spirits lifted. Um, you know, people feel that they've been able to do something. When you're stuck at home and you're not allowed to do anything, you feel helpless and so by giving them these options these activities uh, as simple as creating a card um, as I was saying for, for seniors they feel like they're doing something and so I think for them it's it's giving them a sense of purpose okay we have another question um, how many employees does TELUS have and how does 2020 participation levels how do they compare to uh, pre-pandemic, say, 2019 levels of participation? Have you seen more or less? Um, so we have seen a little less, um, but we've opened it up year round. So what we were trying to do was, so in the past, it, it was the two months. Um, and we, we typically would have uh, 40,000 people globally and 27,000 Canadian. With this um, year, 
what we wanted to do was we didn't want our team to feel pressure. We had a lot of people who were at home, um, homeschooling, taking care of their children, who just didn't necessarily have that extra time. So we wanted to open it up to be a little bit more year round. So a lot of them have participated, which we're finding, but um, haven't necessarily signed up or tracked their hours or they're giving yet. So this is um, just the numbers that we have so far um, of giving. And um, I, I want to say, I, I, I'm not sure I'll have to get back to on what we're at so far for exact numbers is we're, we're just tracking it a little bit differently this year um, because it, it is, it is so different. Okay, great. Well, we have a question about tactics of your program, uh, particularly about the virtual volunteering opportunities. The question is, have you updated your employee volunteering liability waiver to include virtual volunteering? If so, what sort of provisions did you include? Uh, technical legal question for you if you have the answer yeah that's a great question um, I don't think we updated it because I think we may have already had it um, in the past is um, our, our legal department's amazing so they probably would have made sure to capture everything ahead of time um, but I don't believe we did uh, update it for this year okay and we have a question from a participant from China asking what were the challenges of virtual volunteering how did you manage them the challenges um right. definitely was figuring out um what um was you know that in person versus virtual i think it was just also really thinking about what can we make um uh, available for our, our teams i i didn't really find we had that many challenges in in the activities specifically um, where we're looking for. We just had to, in fact, actually I found with the activities, even though we had less activities on there than we typically have, so we've got just over 150 and whereas in the past we've had over 2,000, but because they're virtual, it's been fantastic because teams from all over the um, all over Canada can now participate in it, whereas um, our teams are a bit spread out, so they would often find you know other activities that they would do, but this way they can all participate in one activity across Canada. So it's been it's been really cool that way, and I think we'll continue that having virtual activities available going forward um, into 2021, 2022. So you'll keep some of the things that you experimented yeah. with. Mm -hmm. Great. So we have a comment and a question from Shauna Holmes from Hewlett Packard Enterprises. She says, congratulations on your impactful program. It sounds like the volunteer activities were not required to be done through a formal nonprofit. Is that correct? Yes, that's and correct. Also, yeah. That is correct. So you set them up on your own. Yeah, so we, um, we've created, you know, put up some activities, but a lot of these activities too are from our team members that they have thought of and put up on there. Um, so the cards, of, the cards um, creating cards for seniors actually originated from one of our TELUS community ambassador groups. So prior to this, they would create cards for veterans. And then when they were um, hearing about all the seniors in isolation, they cr um, created the cards for seniors, posted it on the um, our giving platform and it just blew up everybody thought it was such a great idea and have because it was a simple way and a, a easy one to get as I was saying your family involved because everyone was at home with their families and so um, trying to find ways that they could get back together this one was a, a really fun simple one so even though it wasn't necessarily a specific charitable organization that was with it it was giving it was still an act of giving back to the community Great. So a lot of ground, um, uh, grassroots innovation there, looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Shauna has a second part to her question, and, and we hear this a lot. This is a very timely question. Are you also allowing employees to c count advocating for racial justice as volunteering? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's... Yeah, I, I can't go into the exact details of it, but I know that they are working um, depending what they're doing. So we can we always say to, the, you know, if you're making a difference and you're giving back to the community, then you can absolutely can't uh, include it. Great, great. Okay, um, 
we have another question. Um, this has been a hard time for nonprofits, without a doubt. Um, yeah. How do you source volunteer opportunities when nonprofits are overwhelmed? You said that most of your initiatives were grassroots, employees came up with ideas, but you do have some nonprofits, NGOs that you've been working with. And that's can be tricky in the best of times, but when, when nonprofits are overwhelmed, how did you find reaching out to them and adjusting programs? How, how were you able to do that? So we, um, as I mentioned, you know, this is our 15th year of Tell Days of Giving. We have been working with over 500 plus charities for over 15 years. We have really deep rooted relationships with all of these charities. Um, in fact, throughout um, all the different provinces, we have specific team members who are dedicated um, just to our, you know, being that prime for their our charities. And so when the crisis hit, they knew exactly who to call. We, we would call them ourselves and say, hey, we know you're in a time crisis. What do you need? What can we do to help? And um, we were there for them. So we made sure if they needed you know, volunteers, whether it be, and, you know, we did say we can't do the in-person ones. Um, and, uh, but any kind of virtual one, whether it was, you know, providing them our, our devices or um, being there virtually for them, we made sure we were there. So it wasn't, it never was really in, um, something we had to think about because of, of those relationships we have. Good, good. So, I'll tell you, um, Allison, in GCVC, uh, our peer network, we often talk about the challenges and the failures because members learn um, from what others have encountered and, and where others have stumbled. And this is an extraordinary time. So what would you say were some of the hard lessons, the challenges that you learned? And, and I understand you're still going through all of this, but do you have any um, Anything to share in terms of maybe missteps um, or, you know, any hard lessons that you learned, maybe th something you tried, it didn't work, anything you'd like to share with the group in that area? Yeah, I'm, I, th I think, you know, the biggest one was for us um, having that doubt at the very beginning, thinking we would need to cancel Telus Days of Giving. And we should have had, you know, as we quickly saw more faith in our, our team members that, um, you know, that wasn't, shouldn't have even been crossed our minds as an option um, to cancel it, that everybody just wanted to give back and help and be there for our community. So I, I think that one was probably one of our biggest lessons. We're still, as I mentioned, this is um, an, a year long process. So we're continuing with it. We're still learning. Um, but I, I would say that was our biggest uh, stumble. Great, great. Um, also, do you work with um, volunteer organizations outside of um, Canada? So would you ever say mentor? There's a question here from Volunteer Pakistan. Um, wondering if you would ever work with Volunteer Canada and help young volunteering organizations overseas. Um, you have a lot of good examples. Would that be something that you have either done or would consider doing? Oh, absolutely. Of course, we have um, a lot of team members who do participate um, and give back. Um, in fact, we're actually um, sit on the Council of Volunteer Canada, um, and we absolutely work with uh, organizations all over. Great, great. This is uh, the ones I have up here. These are just a spotlight of just a few of them that I thought would be, um, you know, some someone to share, but we've got, as I mentioned, over 150 activities on there. In the past, we've had over 2,000 activities. So um, we, we do a lot, yeah. Great, thank you, thank you. And let me ask you this, Allison. Um, have you given any thought to how you would go back to in-person volunteering in a bigger way, uh, whenever that will be. None of us know when we're going to be able to do that. Have you thought about a going back in to in-person volunteering process and what that might be? I think for 2020, we're really just gonna be focusing still on our virtual um, volunteering. We will, um, we're really just following the guidelines of our of, Can of Canada, what they're telling us for safety guidelines right now. Um, a lot of our provinces are still um, in, you know, phase one, phase two of, of getting back up there. So we're we're really um, 
trying to be, as I mentioned, you know, safety is our number one concern. So we haven't, we're not there thinking about it yet, but probably, uh, as I said, you know, going forward, we'll continue with virtual volunteering. It's opened up so many great opportunities and activities for our teams to participate in together. So I think for 2021, it'll be a mixture. Um, you know, of course, depending where we are with the pandemic, we nobody can really foretell with the future right now, but um, our focus still is on the, our safety of our team members and our community. Good. So we have a question from Olga Hernandez from Accenture. She says, in, you have a very inspiring program. Thank you for your presentation. And she asks how you manage the grassroots volunteering in terms of managing the risks. Are employees able, and also, are employees able to propose events directly in Benevity with some kind of administrative approval? How does that work? She's, she's wondering how you manage those grassroots activities. Yeah. Absolutely. So our team um, vets every single activity that is um, proposed on there. Um, so if there's any that don't seem right um, or aren't safe, we will go back to them, ask more questions, gather more information, um, work with them to, you know, sort of see what we can do to ensure that the safety is there and that um, the, the giving is, is makes sense for to be posted um but no we, we don't allow anybody to just post up um we ensure we're, we're vetting every single one okay we have another question on um given the nature of your volunteer engagements and long-term relationships with nonprofits has the information from this type of the, the types of engagements that you've been doing um, filtered back into how TELUS guides its corporate work. For example, have you thought about new products, um, serving new communities? Has You've had a lot of experience with the volunteering. Has it gone back into the business to think about new ways, new ways of working? It may be early yeah. to ask that, but uh, if you have mm -hmm. evidence, that would be interesting to hear. Yeah, um, so as I sort of briefly mentioned, our um, Mobility for Good program, um, that one was, is one of our, part of our All Connected for Good program. So I would absolutely recommend everyone to check out our site. Um, and that has just absolutely blown up. We've been expanding all of our programs to not only youth, but now to seniors as well and people with disabilities. So we're, we're continuing to look at that. Um, we're in the early stages, but no, we've absolutely been looking at how we, um, with the business part of it, um, to expand our program. Mm -hmm. And as well, we've just developed um, our TELUS Critter masks. So I don't know if you're familiar with us, um, TELUS, but we've got our um, critters. And so we've created masks for um, to sell. And all of that the money is going directly towards the TELUS Future Friendly Foundation, um, which goes directly back to supporting uh, COVID relief. And oh, I, would, I don't think we would ever say before that we would be selling masks. So, you know, <laughs> it's absolutely uh, changing the way we do business and, you know, what our, our products that we're doing and looking at. So absolutely. Mm. Excellent. Another question is, do you provide funding for the volunteer projects? And if so, what sort of expenses are you covering? Yeah, so... Um, in the, in the typically in the past we have we haven't really this year as we haven't had that, that need but um, as I mentioned before um, the gardening and sort of freshening up some of the uh, charitable organizations we would provide uh, sometimes the the cost to cover the paint or the flowers um, it was it's usually um, lower we don't try not to um, typically spend too much but enough that you know we can go in and really make a difference um, in each of the communities depending what we're, the activity is. Okay, excellent. We had so many questions. I'm going to let you catch your breath here a minute. Um, okay, what a fabulous presentation. <laughs> but I know that we have um, someone in the audience, uh, Padma from Cognizant, and Cognizant has an amazing program that I'd like her to share with us. Um, it is, we have a number of um, uh, NGOs on the line, and I think it could be a really interesting and innovative uh, program to share. So I'm going to unmute Padma and let her tell us about that program. Let Thank you, Laurie. 
Great. Please Thank you, Laurie. Tell, us about, tell us about Cognosis. Cognosis. Thank, Thank you so much. Um, that was a lovely presentation, Alison. Very inspiring. Uh, the reach and breadth of your program. Uh, so I am Padma and I'm based in the UK. I lead uh, the Cognizance volunteering program called Outreach for UK and Continental Europe. Um, so when the lockdown happened in the UK uh, on March 20th, uh, we as a team, we are wondering how we could help. We knew we are a technology company and we first instinct was to do something based on technology. And we knew there was going to be a lot of need uh, given that people are going to be using technology to connect in every way. Uh, on the 27th of uh, March, we got a request from uh, one of our employees in Scotland who, was, who had just created a volunteering task force, very similar to the one Alison mentioned, uh, where they would drop leaflets to neighbors and say that we are available to help you um, with your groceries, phone call, medicines, etc. So once they started the register, getting volunteers, within a week, they had 300 volunteers. And it was just three of, well, she with another friend who were moderating it and managing this whole pool. So she approached us saying, is there, can there be a platform which can help us do this? So we brought together uh, seven of our technology specialists. And uh, that's how the Cognizant Assist journey started. And what we kept in mind was that this is going to be used by non-technical people as well. It could be elderly, it could be used in any part of the world because we knew COVID is, is global and it should be used so usable even after COVID, uh, wherever there is community volunteering. So keeping this in mind, we designed a platform which brings together volunteers, uh, beneficiaries or people who need help and donors. This is the, we had a lot of cases where people want said, I have, I have, a farm and I have lots of vegetables which I want to donate. There are restaurants saying that we want to donate food to anybody who needs, uh, but where do we go and give it? So there are people who wanted to donate but didn't know whom to reach and how to reach. So those were the donors, so not donation in cash, but in kind. And then the charities themselves who wanted to moderate and manage this whole thing, including councils uh, in the UK. So this platform brings all these three uh, stakeholders together and enables the, uh, a moderator, a team to uh, efficiently manage the request. So what happens when, as a end user, uh, I, I, I want to message and say, I have nothing to, uh, no dinner, or I have no food for my children for today or tomorrow. I it's a very simple intuitive app where I go in and say, this is my address and I don't have food. And uh, immediately based on the postcode, the moderator can then say who are the volunteers available around that area and map a match a volunteer to the particular beneficiary. Now, one of the biggest challenges we have seen across uh, the volunteering that's going on is people volunteer, they register, and then the circumstances change. You're unwell, your family is unwell, you're self-isolating. So the moderating, uh, uh, the councils or the moderating teams or the charities need to make 10 phone calls to find one volunteer who's available on that particular street or that area who can or deliver that service. So this feature as a volunteer, you have it on your phone, you just turn it on and off saying I'm available now, I'm not available from nine to five, I'm available later in the day. And uh, similarly, the donors can say I have all this available and the only moderator can access and map the donor saying, these volunteers will come and pick up the stuff and then they can then decide who it gets delivered to. So that is a gist of what this platform does. And we have we are delivering this and it went live on 27th of April for the Narain uh, Task Force Scotland, which is now up to 450 volunteers. And since then it has got implemented across seven charities, five in India, one in US, uh, and one is a council in the UK which is now catering to 14 wards. Uh, and this is completely free of cost for any charity, any community volunteering group who is delivering relief support for COVID. And uh, it just takes two hours to implement. We run through a due diligence process to see the fitment and uh, then our team would uh, implement it. There is no infrastructure cost. It is completely done on Google Cloud. So that is the brief about the uh, platform. Uh, we just wanted to reach as many people because we know that there is a desperate need for something like this. It's best that we are not able to reach out. 
Um, so if you are, uh, if you think this is something that would support you, please contact Outreach UK at cognizant.com. I think Laurie can share at the end of the meeting. And if you're interested, we can host a demo for your team uh, or group of teams, and we can take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Padma. I thought this your program would be of interest given uh, the audience today. And we will sh share with each of the participants uh, information that Allison has provided, and we will also share the information on Cognitive Assist. You'll get an email from us uh, today or tomorrow on that. So Allison, now that you've had a chance to have a drink of water, <laughs> I wonder if you have any final thoughts about uh, your program, any advice you'd give to those listening? You have quite an interesting program. You've really made a lot of adaptions on the fly. Uh, any final words for the listeners about how to implement a program like you have done? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I, I think the, the biggest thing that I take away is, you know, people really want, do want to help, but they just, they don't often know how and they don't know what to do. So they don't. So I think if by creating a program, I would re highly recommend, um, you know, creating those very simple communications with step-by-step -step instructions, providing examples of activities, and then even with those within those activities, sharing them out with the teams and saying, here is a you know an activity you could do as a team. Here uh, here are some examples of how um, you can get your team together. Make it a um, a team building activity. Here is a template email you can use um, to get your team excited about it. Um, and that's what we've done. Uh, we've created temp a lot of template emails that we've sh shared with our um, leadership team that they can use. Uh, and it just, it kind of gives them those step by steps on how, how to do it. Um, and so I think that would be my, my biggest takeaway or, um, to, to recommend to everybody. Excellent, excellent. That is uh, a note of, of happiness in this uh, chaotic world that people do want to help and if we show them a way, uh, volunteering can really make a difference. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you, Allison. Um, thank you to our audience for you know all your great questions. Uh, again, this webinar was recorded, so if you have colleagues who'd like to listen to this, uh, they'll have the chance. That will be up on the IAVE webinar uh, site very soon, iave.org. And uh, we will be continuing to provide more resources to support volunteers in all forms, uh, corporate and otherwise. And um, up here you can see uh, our website specific to COVID-19 and look for announcements for more programs uh, throughout the year. Thank you everyone and we will speak to you again soon. Thank you.